This week on Dialogue, the future of women and the Arab Spring. Welcome to the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars in Washington, D.C. I'm John Molesky. Each week, Dialogue explores the world of ideas and issues in international affairs, history, and culture. Now let's meet our guests. Moshira Khatab is a human rights activist who formerly served as Minister of Family and Population for Egypt. She also served as Assistant Minister of Foreign Affairs, Vice Chair of the UN Committee on the Rights of the Child, and was Egypt's ambassador to South Africa during the Mandela era. Lilia Labidi is an anthropologist and professor at the University of Tunis, who currently serves as Minister of Women's Affairs in the Republic of Tunisia. Previously, she was a visiting professor at the American University in Cairo and a fellow here at the Wilson Center. Hale Esfandiari is author of the book, My Prison, My Home, One Woman's Story of Captivity in Iran. Hale serves as the director of the Woodrow Wilson Center's Middle East program. Welcome to the program. Thanks for being Thank with you. us. Thank you for inviting us. Th this thing that we call the, the Arab Spring, let's begin with you, uh, Minister Labidi. Uh, th th it's, uh, it began in your country with a street vendor. So people know the history of it, know the story, but if you could tell us that story, retell that story from your perspective, when did this first become apparent to you that something large was happening? For me from my perspective. I think uh, um, in November, since uh, the last election in, 19, uh, in 2009, uh, people were uncomfortable with this election. And in uh, June, uh, July uh, 2010, uh, some people from the family of uh, Ben Ali and his wife uh, became to organize a call for election of Ben Ali in 2014. And people were really upset about this. They were unhappy. They were saying, how we begin only uh, this election, and already they are asking for the new re-election, etc. This is one thing. Donc, the atmosphere was that something is not good happening in the country. and. Uh, if you if you look at uh, the youth movement, for example, the uh, singers, as those who have the rap singers, etc., we, we we saw immediately that the youth became very virulent, very aggressive in their songs about the, the uh, re-election of Ben Ali. And so the protest songs of the became absolutely, popular. Absolutely, absolutely. And then uh, the Facebook, the movement of social movement, Facebook, bloggers, etc., all this information about what's happened and what we need to do. And then we had the demonstration uh, after the uh, Mohammed Bouazizi who burned himself, etc. Then it became a popular popular movement because the youth uh, were uh, felt very angry about what's happened to Mohammed Bouazizi and then they organized several, several demonstrations were so, so in many ways what he did, his, his dramatic protest, exactly. was uh, the tipping point on momentum that already absolutely. was building. Absolutely. It was very, very um, important moment and uh, the youth recognized it as something that it is not acceptable. And uh, they became to organize um, um, normally, without any organization, because it was uh, without political leader, it was uh, women and men, it was... Uh, uh, the, and something that it was very interesting, that the youth, very youth, children even, have recorded the social movement with their phone with their cell phone. And uh, these uh, pictures or video were on the immediately, the immediately on the Facebook and uh, so on. And or, certainly, Minister Hatab, seen in Egypt. <laughs> and so talk to us about your perspective on, on how what we're calling the Arab Spring spread to your country. Well, uh, of course, inspired by what happened in Tunisia was the uh, uh, events of uh, 25th of uh, January, and this was the third year in a row 
that youth would organize such a protest on police day. And it started by protesting against police uh, malpractice, uh, impunity, vis-a-vis uh, uh, -vis torture that took place in uh, police stations. And they went down calling for that and uh, quickly it turned into calling to bring down the entire regime. What I see in this is the invigorating role of youth, empowered youth, educated youth, not the ones who are suffering. These are the ones who have comfortable life, yet they took off to the street uh, girls, uh, Besides boys, uh, young and old, the entire nation was engulfed into this uh, revolution and they were persistent. They said, we will not go home till we get what we want. At what and point in the, during the protest did you believe that that was the case, that this was going to be seen through to the end and the only acceptable response would be Mubarak resigning? It was evident because the increasing number of people in the street, uh, it was uh, a sign of uh, peaceful determination and persistence. They were creating enormous uh, pressure simply by being in the street. Minister Labidi mentioned the songs and popular culture. Did, did that manifest itself in Egypt? Did you see that type of uh, uh, reaction from young people? Yes, in Egypt, the last three years have seen a wave of protests in drama, in songs, in protests in the street. We have many uh, independent newspapers that were publishing all kinds of criticism. So it was evident over a number of, uh, of years and, and actually, after the events happened, people started to go back and read. There were sites that people didn't look at carefully. There were songs and, uh, and articles in the papers, and you find a huge repertoire. Hale, when you were watching all of this unfold, uh, you had to think of the Green Movement in Iran. And talk to us about associations you have with that. And maybe we shouldn't be speaking about something beginning in Tunisia. Maybe it actually <laughs> began in Iran. I, I believe it began in Iran in 2009 uh, after the manipulated elections and when people expected President Ahmadinejad not to win for a second time, but when the result of the elections were announced, so first tens of thousands of people, then a million people came out into the street of Tehran, very peaceful demonstration, just uh, shouting, where is my vote? But I think there was a big difference and, uh, between Iran, Tunisia and uh, Egypt. In Iran, the military decided to side with the government, to clamp down, to use force. And within two, three days, we saw thousands of protesters being arrested, gone down on the street, you know, arrested, taken to prison, tortured, and, you know, and the rest of it, we know. Well, I think in Tunisia and in Egypt, after the police, at least in Egypt, and Moshira will correct me if I'm wrong, after the first clampdown, once the military announced that more or less it respects the wish of the people, same thing in Tunisia, then I believe that the head of states didn't have any other choice but to leave, while in Iran this was not the case. So uh, watching, I think, what happened in Tunisia and especially in Egypt created a sense of, uh, I don't know, nostalgia, wish in Iran, why did it not happen? with us. Right. Well, the, the military being that ultimate exactly. wild card sure. in the equation. That's the main element. You've all talked about the role that youth played, and we frame out our discussion about the role of women. And for you, that's not theoretical. That's the lives that you're leading. Uh, but, but one of the things that was very dramatic and symbolic of the imagery, the iconic imagery of the protests, is what you, you described as boys and girls together. Mm -hmm. In societies that are often known for segregation, we almost saw spontaneous desegregation. Mm -hmm. If all of you could just uh, talk about that and what that meant to you to, and how important that is to the future. Really, it was a, it was a surprise because when 
when we see these old youth in rural area, the poorest part of Tunisia, where men and women were demonstrating together, it was something very, very strong and powerful. And this, I think, played a lot on the social imaginary and how the President uh, Ben Ali, who left, decided that it was the end. And why, in the same time, why the military didn't accept to uh, why they didn't accept it, how we call it? To support uh, to, Ben Ali? To, yes, to support yeah. Ben Ali. I think this was a, a, a crucial, crucial moment. And then... Well, they're seeing their children in the streets in some absolutely, cases, I'm guessing. Absolutely, absolutely. And the fact that uh, he, the army didn't support Ben Ali was very powerful for the youth, for the society, for men and women. Look, we saw this, not only this, we saw women demonstrating and they were an, on the shoulders of men. And this was something exceptional. Another thing, we saw several women wearing the flag, wearing the flag and demonstrating, etc. And we saw other thing, how women from, of, from different ages calling for uh, Ben Ali to go out. And these different elements, youth, middle age, old women, etc., were all present and very active in the movement. Is this the beginning of something significant in this regard, or is this, this spontaneous desegregation limited to this dramatic moment? Well, in Egypt, there isn't that strong desegregation. Uh, the, you know, boys and girls go to school together, go to the university together. It is true there is a growing conservatism, growing religious conservatism, but I would like to look at the events in Tahrir Square as expressing the true nature of Egyptians. There was amazing peaceful coexistence between different trends. Like you have very modern girls and boys, very conservative boys and girls, young and old, rich and poor, every segment of the society accepting the others. Like uh, you have uh, uh, boys and girls uh, sleeping in the square for a week because they refuse to leave the square till they get what they want. In Egyptian traditions, this doesn't happen, but they were doing it and facing them, there was the, the, this very conservative religious groups respecting them and supporting them. So it was a great time of accepting the others, tolerance. And this is the spirit that we are all counting on its continuation. Holland, that you don't, I'm sorry, excuse sorry, me, forgive you me. You don't exclude the others. The other point I want to comment, uh, which you raised, is the role of the military. Mm -hmm. If, uh, like uh, Hala said, the military did not side with the people, we would have seen a lot of bloodshed. So all the hopes were hanging on the military, and what will the military do? Uh, millions of people in the square with the tanks, and they're jumping all over and some of them sometimes losing their te temper, the people losing their temper, and it's amazing how the military controlled, they exercised maximum self-restraint. Which was not a guaranteed outcome, given that Mubarak himself was of the military. This was his base. Mm -hmm. This is a very interesting point, that people did not make this link. And of course, it took a lot of courage from the military to make this decision. And it saved a lot of uh, blood, and it, uh, it secured the peaceful course of the revolution. Holly, this youthful breaking down of barriers, uh, we, we talk about this spontaneous desegregation as one example of that. Uh, apply that to the whole region, beyond Tunisia, beyond Egypt. What are, what are we seeing regionally? Um, look, first of all, in 2009 in Iran, one image that stuck in my mind is in a Friday prayer, which is very common every Friday, arranged by the government, you suddenly saw for the first time a girl and a boy kneeling together yes. and praying. This was unheard of. Yes. This was the beginning of desegregation. Unlike Tunisia and Egypt, 
for the previous 30 years, the Iranian regime had been trying to segregate the society, and because of the push of the younger people, they, have, they did not succeed. But in public, it was a more or less in prayers, Friday prayers and so on, it was a segregated society. But with those demonstrations, this was at. Mm -hmm. What we saw after Tunisia and Egypt, the ripple effect of Tunisia, first on Egypt, the ripple effect of Tunisia, on Egypt, on Yemen, there were no desegregation the first few weeks. In the, exactly. there was desegregation, there was no the, the, uh, segregation. Mm -hmm. The first demonstrations against Saleh, Men and women yes, were together, absolutely. and this is in a very conservative tribal yes. society, you know. So you saw that. You saw the same thing in Bahrain, you know. You saw it. Mm. And today when you see sporadic demonstrations in Jordan, I'm saying sporadic, you know, in uh, Morocco, you know, you see men and, men and women, women demonstrating together. And this is, you can't force this segregation on societies where over 50 percent of the population is under the age of 30. Mm. And they are wire savvy. They know what is going on in well, the rest well, of the world. That part of it, you know, one of the great debates has been how significant things like social media, which you mentioned in mm -hmm. your first response, are to this. Clearly, generationally, there's a group of young people that are linked in a way that we or previous generations never were. Exactly. Is, so, but you know, can we overstate this, or or is this really at the heart of the ability to organize? I, I will I will say two things. I think this is the fact of the education, the impact of the education on the youth. Secondly, the pro demographic problem. The youth are a large group in the Arab world today. And third is the social, the third is the social movement, the access to new technology, the fact that they can, they know how to use it, uh, internet, uh, computer, uh, uh, Photoshop, etc., etc. Which uh, prov it's uh, even if we know how to use it, we are not as comfortable with it as they can. Come be. so naturally. Yes, and I think these. Uh, LM is a demographic, a generational problem, demographic uh, problem, and technology uh, problem, which helped a lot this kind of movement. I don't think that could happen five years earlier. I don't, I don't think so, really. Don't, this is uh, something that, uh, which uh, it uh, reinforced the idea that there is a problem of generation. We had a lot of social uh, movement as the human rights, uh, etc., but they didn't take this form. Mm -hmm. Donc, this is important. I think uh, if you can put headlines on what happened, uh, you speak about the amazing role of social media, the amazing role of the youth and women. And these are three surprises for a society that used to look at social media, especially the internet and the mobile technology, as something that is distracting the attention of the youth, keeping them in an ivory t uh, tower. Uh, suddenly, the entire society realized that youth, while staying home, they galvanized the entire nation with their fingertips. So this really changed the perception of such tools to the entire society, decision makers, grassroots, what have you. Uh, the, the, the period of the rev revolution in Egypt witnessed doubling the number of users, you know, Twitters and the Facebook, mm -hmm. uh, and, and actually the heavy toll of human lives in the Egyptian revolution go back to the decision to disconnect the internet because then you were worried what happened, what happened, and everybody took to the street to find out what happened. Mm -hmm. So it was really the wrong thing uh, to do. So uh, now social media is a, a, a weapon, uh, very easy, uh, not costly, and uh, it tells you that you can no longer uh, discriminate against any 
society, any segment of the population, because now everybody knows what's happening everywhere. Or I, if I want to know, it's at my fingertip. So any uh, leader, any decision maker will think twice now before making a decision that will uh, uh, be uh, not fair to, to a certain group in the society. I would add to all this text messaging too, because when the government, at least in Iran, tried to slow down the internet, everybody has a cell phone in Egypt, in Tunisia, no matter where you go, in the remote provinces, people start text messaging her. You send a message, there are government troops in such and such a square. So everybody goes to another square. Or somebody got killed on this street. There is a picture taken mm. immediately. The news is broadcast. So John, everything has changed. There is a whole new dynamic exactly. in the region. And the governments have to deal with it. But what we see, they can't, they don't. Look at what's happening in Syria. They seem not to get the message that they are dealing with a different generation. Mm. That's the problem. Before we, believe it or not, we're into our final five minutes of our discussion. It always goes quickly with such interesting people as guests. Uh, before we end, I know we've spent our time looking at the present and looking forward. I want to take a moment for each of you to look back on your lives and your careers. Uh, as I said earlier, for talking about the role of women in, in this region of the world is not a theory for you. It's, it's been your life. Mm -hmm. So if you could look back and reminisce and, and, and maybe talk about the most significant changes you've seen over the time that you've been an activist, that you've become a government minister, the things that you've all done. And let's begin with you, if we could, please. I will say two things quickly about this. I, f I feel that the period under Ben Ali was uh, um, something that it was very, very difficult, and that uh, we, will, we will pay the price of it for a long time. And that uh, this period for us is a very, very important one, as much as the independence. And that uh, this period for us, when, when I say for us, is six months from January until July or eight months until September, is something which we are working against these 23 years under Ben Ali and uh, changing the constitution. It was so much uh, touched and re re written, etc., etc., that it was really uh, a difficult period. Donc, we don't want now to go back to something similar to it, and uh, we look carefully at uh, every decision, each point, etc., because it's uh, we don't want it to go back to what we went through. Mr. Hatab, for you, what, when you, you look at this personally, what's the biggest change you've seen in the role of women in your lifetime or, when, or the achievement you've been in, involved with yeah. that is the most meaningful? I think when I look back, I, I think I have, uh, I'm proud to be part of a team that put the seed for such a change. When we went to the poorest areas and we opened girls-friendly schools, where we encouraged girls who didn't even have birth certificates to go to school and get high-quality education and encourage them to break the poverty cycle and have dreams to become something. I feel proud that we criminalized female genital mutilation, a very, very barbaric form of violence against girls. I feel proud that we raised the minimum age of marriage for girls so that the girl can continue her education and be an individual. I feel proud that we encourage these marginalized children to raise their voice and speak up. We created networks for youth to be part of the change. I feel very proud of this, and I think that this has encouraged many youth to, to speak up and uh, forced others to listen to them and take into account what they say. Well, I have the privilege of working in the same organization and building with Holly, and I, I have to tell you, she, when she talks about this, she's so excited, she's practically jumping out of her seat. So I know this has meant a lot to you. Uh, share with us also your personal feelings about wh where you started, what you've worked on, and where we are today. Uh, John, I'm the granddaughter of a woman who, when the veil was abolished in Iran, refused to leave the house for seven years until mm. 
the right was you had the right to choose. I never thought that in my life I'd go through another system that would impose the veil, meaning that taking away the choice from women to wear or not to wear. But what I think I'm very proud of is that the seed that we planted for women's rights before the revolution had seeped down, you know, the idea had seeped down to all strata of society. So when, after the Islamic revolution, when the personal status, when the family protection law was suspended, it was basically ordinary women who came out in the street and said, we don't want to live under a system that promotes polygamy. We don't want to lose a child custody right. We don't want not to have the right to go and seek a divorce. And over the last 30 years, these women are the ones who have been pushing the regime to make big concession to women. But it's not where we were before the revolution. One more thing, in prison, during my interrogation, I felt how scared my interrogators, who represented the intelligence ministry, were from women's movement. <laughs> I mean, there, it was amazing how scared they were. And that's why, during the Green Movement, they, when they came out, they treated women and men with total equality. Beating men, beating <laughs> women. Arresting men, arresting women. Torturing men, torturing women. That's the only place where equality is observed. Some progress we could do without, I suppose. We, uh, we're out of time, unfortunately. I want to thank you not only for joining thank us you today, much. but thanks for your important work on an ongoing matter and continued success to all of you. Thank you. Uh, we'll return next week with another edition of Dialogue. Until then, for all of us at the Wilson Center, I'm John Molesky. Thanks for joining us. We'd like to hear from you. Please send your questions or comments to dialogue at wilsoncenter.org. You can also follow us on Facebook. Search Dialogue Radio and Television. Our host Twitter feed is twitter.com slash John Malevsky. Dialogue is a co-production of the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars and MHZ Networks. Dialogue is available via broadcast, cable, satellite, and telco on MHZ Worldview throughout the United States. To see how to watch where you live, visit www.mhznetworks.org.